Until very late in the 20th century, for most people, their primary source of information on any subject would be sitting on a short stretch of shelving in a library. Carefully curated resources, given legitimacy by being selected to take up precious physical space next to their duodecimal counterparts. Most of these resources would have been written by experts and painstakingly quality controlled via a rigorous publishing method. Now, obviously, it's expensive and time consuming to produce knowledge in this form. So it makes sense to ensure that your authors have a good grasp of their subject area and that only the most pertinent information ends up in the library. In contrast to this, the web is an inexpensive and agile way to reach a potentially vast audience. You don't need to be an institutionally verified expert to express an opinion or to review a series of facts. If your material is ranked highly in search results, you will be read by many. In the online environment where curation is by algorithm, not librarian, convenience and relevance often outstrip traditional notions of credibility and authority. The web brings into question what it means for a source of information to be legitimate. And it highlights the trust we place in the form and provenance of those sources. For example, the philosopher John Locke wrote, the only fence against the world is a thorough knowledge of it. But let's imagine that instead of producing this book, Locke had tweeted his thoughts and then gone on to explain them in a blog post. Would his ideas have the same value, the same resonance, if they were online and not in this volume in front of me? We can think of the tension between traditional forms of knowledge and the web as being a bit like two forms of currency. The first is the well-established, reliable currency of known institutions. Universities, publishing houses, for example, and the known experts who are validated by those institutions. This is a stable currency that has been around for hundreds of years. The second form of currency is the new pretender. It's still emerging and its value is very difficult to assess. Its search rankings, likes, followers, views, comments, its blogs, Wikipedia, Twitter, Facebook. Its value changes radically depending on the context it's used in. Now this form of currency tends to be traded at the resident end of the visitor and residence continuum and is predominantly produced and promoted by individuals rather than institutions. Now the exchange rate from our well-established currency out onto the web is very good. Books, journals, videos of lectures, academic and media personas, they all tend to retain their value when converted to the digital and put out online. The exchange rate in the other direction, though, is very poor. But this is slowly shifting as institutions come to want more visibility and reputation online. Will there come a time when having thousands and thousands of Twitter followers, for example, will be part of what it takes to move up the career ladder? Or when citing a blog post is as respectable as citing a journal paper? When we ask students and staff why they choose to use the web over and above other options, convenience is always the top reason given. This often outstrips the desire for accuracy, authority and legitimacy. We want fast results and the web usually gives us good enough usable answers. So for example, some teaching staff may openly frown on the use of Wikipedia but its sheer convenience means that while it won't be discussed or cited openly by learners, it will inevitably be used. This generates a kind of learning black market in which the scale of the use of non-traditional online sources is hidden. What's created when this happens is a tension between the day-to-day -day learning practices of students using the web and the requirements of formal academia. Now, this in principle is not new, but the web amplifies the situation forcing students to spend more time negotiating the distance between how they actually learn and what they perceive to be legitimate learning practices from an institutional perspective. 
Have we created the learning black market by challenging uncritical approaches to information seeking or by holding on to traditional forms of education too tightly? Some learners hope that search engines will improve to the point that they won't need to critically evaluate results. Working on a think less, find more basis is one of the promises of online searching. The idea that as we offer more of ourselves to the web, it will be able to provide us with ever more tailored responses to our questions. We'll never get a wrong answer, even if we struggle to frame the question. This perhaps cuts across our expectations of what it means to study and what it means to share information. Certainly, if we don't take this into account, then the gap will simply widen between current learning practices and the requirements of academia. Discussions around the legitimacy of information online could lead us into thinking of the web as only being like a kind of chaotic library. In fact, it's the creation and sharing of material that defines the resident end of the continuum. Of course, historically, students wouldn't have been expected to produce publishable work until they undertook their PhD. Work that was good enough to go out into the world or end up on the shelves of a library like this one. Now with the web, they've got the opportunity to express opinions and to develop a professional persona openly as soon as they feel confident enough to do so. Staff too have the opportunity to move their professional practice online to become more resident. It's relatively easy to set up a Twitter account or a blog, for example, without having to jump through lots of bureaucratic hoops. You can build up a following online and become influential without first having to climb the career ladder to a senior institutional position. And in some ways, the web's actually disintermediating the institution by providing a shortcut for staff to communicate directly with potentially large audiences. But who are these audiences? Who should they be? Do we consider it our job to only communicate with those that have paid to engage directly with our institution? Or should we be using the web to communicate with a much wider network of learners? Is it a valid use of my time to build up a professional network online? Is it legitimate for me to discuss my thoughts, my ideas about work in blog posts? Should I be spending time editing and improving Wikipedia pages? And more importantly, what kind of recognition will I get for my efforts? How does any of this help me? Is our responsibility only towards those who are privileged enough to be part of the system, or is it also towards those who are looking in or simply passing by? Before we get carried away, it's worth remembering that most incoming students have a very traditional view of education. Just them, some books, and possibly the chance to connect with an expert. At least that's what they tell us when we ask them what they think university will be like. Of course, most students' learning practices are far more complex than this. But when we talk to them, they tend to implicitly make a distinction between the processes of formal education, essays, lectures, labs, exams, and the practice of learning, which is a far broader category. The point is that even if we're keen on more open, resident forms of practice, even if we believe that students should be able to use and include all of the resources available to them and develop a voice online, they themselves are likely to be wary of this approach, or at least wary of discussing it. It's not uncommon for students' visitor and residence maps to have very little activity in this resident institutional quadrant here, with the majority of their personal activity being up in this quadrant here, and the majority of their educational related activity being down here in this quadrant. This tends to be because educational institutions are, as you might expect, geared around visitor modes of engagement. Now, expecting individuals to automatically transition their resident practice from personal to more institutional contexts is a dangerous assumption to make. These kind of transitions, institutions can perhaps encourage or facilitate, but they probably can't own. Taking a more resident approach to education is more than just a question of technology. It confronts underlying conceptions of what it means to learn and what it means to know.
We'll be right back. 